Welcome to the Touch MBA Admissions Podcast. Do you need help figuring out which schools to apply to or how to get into the world's top MBA programs? Hey, you're not alone. Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey guys, what's up? It's Darren. Welcome to the Touch MBA podcast. Hope you're doing great. Hope you're enjoying your Julys wherever you are in the world. This week, we are continuing with our MBA career series. I brought on another longtime friend, Vince Faraday, who attended the London Business School and came out of there about 10 years ago uh, to come on the show and talk about careers in the energy industry. And I think this is one of the best conversations we've had on the podcast. I hope you take a lot of value from it. Vince shares, you know, a lot about recruiting in the energy industry and what it takes, but also just career success in general and ways you can stand out to land that MBA internship and to land that first MBA job and and how to grow throughout your career. So a couple of times during the show, Vince and I joke about our mutual friend, Mark Z, who was just recently on the podcast, episode 133, uh, Breaking into Media and Entertainment, as well as episode 48, Inside UCLA Anderson as a non-traditional candidate. Mark, Vince, and myself, we all met in Singapore when we were all international fellows at a program called Princeton in Asia, which sends young graduates out to all over Asia, essentially, to do service positions and work, whether you're, you know, teaching English, or in my case, I was teaching statistics, or maybe you're writing for um, a newspaper in Cambodia, whatever it may be. So I have to plug uh, that program, Princeton in Asia. That's how we met. And that's why we make (laughs) fun of each other and have a lot of great memories from that time. And remember, if you're interested in international MBA programs like the London Business School, INSEAD, IE, ESC, those are some of the bigger names, IMD, um, in Europe or Asia or Canada, in addition to the US, you can come to touchmba.com to get guidance there. That's what we really try to specialize in. We know there's a lot of great programs, obviously in the US, that's where the MBA was born. But I believe there's lots of great MBA experiences outside the US. If you need help in your international business school search, you can come to touchmba.com. Just one final note, I want to make clear that uh, Vince's opinions are are his own and don't you know represent LBS or any of his employers like Google where he currently is now. I hope this is obvious, but hey, that's part of the beauty of these conversations with close friends, right? Is that it's just two friends talking and it's super open. So uh, I hope you enjoy the episode, but just remember, yeah, that Vince's opinions are his own. All right, let's get to the show. Vince Faraday, welcome to the Touch MBA podcast, your first podcast, I believe, right? First podcast. Thanks, Darren. Great to be here. Thanks for having me. And we go way back. We go even further back than Singapore. We go back hip hop dance company stuff way, way back. That's so that's true. Maybe we put that on another pod. And and Vince is being very generous because Vince was the hip hop dancer in, in that dance group. And I was like the scary fan who would go to their practices and just watch you were dance. you were you were a king of the groupies <laughs> I was the king of the groupies <laughs> for sure um, so Vince if you could tell our audience what were you doing before business school and where did you end up going for your MBA yeah thanks Darren really appreciate it great to be here with everybody so it's it's almost August of 2018, and I was, I don't know if, if we, this was intentional or purely by coincidence, but it's literally 10 years ago this month that I went to business school. So I started at London Business School in London, England, UK in August of 2008. So as I was thinking about this, this pod ahead of time, it was all the memories come flooding back, but also the 10 years that have passed in between are both like very present, also kind of a blur. So yeah, it's it was, it was an amazing experience that I had at, at LBS. It certainly launched me in a career that I'm incredibly passionate about, and I definitely wouldn't be where I was today without it. But just to 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 paint a bigger, a little bit of a picture. So yeah, Darren and I were went to college together. We yes spent a couple of years in Singapore working for a nonprofit that had a similar mission to the Peace Corps. After that, I spent a couple of years in New York working for 
it was a startup that and ended up being a, a buy side research firm that was doing research for hedge funds from 2005 to 2008. And for anybody playing along at home, I feel like I'm gonna. This is like the quiz I'll give to my grandkids at some day. Be like, and what happened in 2008? Well, <laughs> uh, the world economy went uh, sideways, and I had an interesting front row seat, I would say, to the the crisis in 2007, 2008. I certainly don't want to pretend like I was really, really involved that way, but was in New York and sort of saw a lot of the things that were happening, at least peripherally, because I was working in finance and the investing world. And was, again, thinking about like some of the like, remember some of the, the like, when I had my LBS alumni interview, which is really what I had as like, as the interview as an American guy lived in, in Brooklyn and like we were, at, he was asking me questions as part of his like, his, his like, was this guy good enough for LBS interview? And he was asking me about like credit default swaps and mortgage backed security. And I was like, yeah, right. And I, I, I remember I struggled to an answer and then he didn't seem to notice. And I think that was the, like, <laughs> nobody really knew what was going on <laughs> at the time. So I'm kind of going off on a tangent, but the point is here, like I, 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 I luckily just pure dumb luck went got accepted to London Business School, went in the, in the fall or summer of 2008. That was, of course, like after Bear Stearns. It was right before Lehman. That's when I was in London. And wow. like, you know, everything went to hell. And so I remember people saying, so my, I, I bring that up because not just like the personal anecdote, but like my business school experience was, I think, very colored by that time period. Like how, how couldn't it have been? You know, it was going in at the time when a lot of things were, were muffing. And to be clear, like I want to like, it was a lot worse for many, many more people. I was a lucky one. I was in business school. And so I don't want to pretend like this was like some you know, personal, mm. you know, but it was an interesting coloring of the experience where I think like the, the cliches of business school that at least I somehow knew come like from like the nineties, early two thousands was, you know, you went in, you had like a two year vacation and you came out with like some sweet job at McKinsey. Like that was a cliche. And like, I think that was probably true for a lot of people probably not too far from when I went in. It's just that in 2008, everything changed. And it changed wow. in London super too, too, because I remember there were like a couple of like little anecdotes that you might find, that your listeners might find interesting was like the London LBS, I think wasn't still as a pretty heavy consulting school finance as yeah. pretty, you know, it would reflective of London. A bunch of investment banks pulled their entire summer in internships that year. So, like, I remember we were going through that process and, like, all of a sudden internships just evaporated. Some people had their, like, some people that were a year ahead of us had their, like, full time offers, full time offers rescinded after they were. So, it was stuff like oh. that where, again, like, you know, we're, these are like white collar jobs, like, kind of many more people. But business school was for me kind of going through this very chaotic, uh, disorienting time period in the global economy. I remember people, two other things, people would say, people, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, this, you're going in at the perfect time because in two years you're going to come out, right. everything's going to be fine. Right. Here we are 10 years later and um, it's, that's, that's debatable. And so I, I, it, it made me ultimately though, I think like my business school experience was different because going in and then coming out, I was after something different personally, but I think it was also, a, I would, I'm hesitant to say that my experience was emblematic because it was, everybody had a kind of, kind of a scramble those years. Um mm. And mm -hmm. what I did going in, back to your original question, I mean, I had been working for this investment research firm. I focused on energy and I just fell into that by pure happenstance, but found out that I loved it. And it was a combination of everything from traditional oil and gas, energy company research, equity research, essentially. Yeah. But at that point, mid 2000s, it was things like biofuels were coming up early, what we were calling alternative energy. So like and solar had been around for a while, but there was really for the first time talking about solar PV. And I remember actually there had been some, one of our friends, Darren in Singapore had done yep. a lot of work with solar. And so like, this was something that was always kind of in the back of my mind, super interesting. I just fell into it and I fell into it hard. It's this amazing energy, it's this amazing industry that's both super global, super local. For me, I felt and became sort of very passionate about the fight against climate change and using the energy sector as a, as a mechanism to do that. It's, I mean, I had grown up as somebody who was aware of the environment and of the climate, but really seeing it through the prism of what the transition is happening in the energy sector in the early 2000s, it's something that I really kind of fell into and really became very passionate about devoting myself to both helping businesses and economies grow, but also crucially doing that in pursuit of a larger goal of, of helping to um, to avert the worst effects of climate change. And so I've got a bunch of thoughts on that and, and how we're doing, relatively speaking. But my, my ultimate long way of saying, I wanted to go into business school at LBS, coming out the other end, working at a company that was 
operating in this space. And so it was probably going to be technology, but maybe one of the energy companies, I was kind of like tired of helping, uh, you know, hedge funds invest. Mm. I wanted to actually be doing some, doing something tangible. And so crafted my business whole experience around that. Candidly, in 2008, that was kind of like, I would call that like the other career path. It wasn't as well trodden. Huh. Yeah. As I mentioned, every, like about a third of the people went into finance, a third went into consulting. And then there, we used to call it LBS. It was industry was like, was like other. That's right. But yeah. That was mostly like some like marketing agencies, like some FMCG, some energy companies, like some of the big oil and gas majors would recruit for like rotational programs. But everything I was doing was, was a little bit different. And anyway, subsequently have been really thrilled at, at what a, my career has sort of done. And I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, it's taken some, some twists and turns in ways that I wasn't expecting. But I, I left London. I came back to the US. I'm originally from, from New England. I took a job in Boston with a company called Enernock that did something called demand response, which was sort of smart grid technology focused on, on the utility sector and, and energy efficiency, distributed yeah. energy resources. Spent seven years there. So grew to, Kind of came in as like a post MBA doing marketing. That's so they were putting a lot of marketing. They were putting post MBAs there that year and grew to more of a market development and sales role. And then by the end, I was putting together deals with utilities around the world to try to do um, essentially uh, distributed energy resources, virtual power plants. And so left Enernock, uh just about a year ago, actually, and spent seven years or a lot longer than I expected mm. to, but it was a great ride and, and super, super, it got a lot of opportunities to work all over the world. And then left about a year ago, joined Nest and have been thrilled. And Nest has just recently been, it was always a part of Google, at least it was for the past three years or so, was, Nest was acquired by Google. Right. Uh, but more recently, we've been wrapped more fully up under the Google hardware org. Um, so, I mean, Nest was, again, you could, it was one of the other bets that was another essentially company within the Alphabet corporate umbrella. But now we're, we're firmly part of Google again. So I work for Google and that's what, what I do in my, my day to day. And it's, it's been exciting. What we're doing is trying to, to help advance the deployment of the Nest thermostat, especially, but also some of the other Nest products and Google hardware around the smart home. And yes. again, in pursuit of, of climate goals. And so helping uh, customers save energy, the Nest thermostat can help save anywhere between 10 to 15% on, on heating and cooling. And what I do is to help connect those opportunities with utilities, primarily in the eastern part of the U.S., um, yep. But increasingly more around the country and hopefully at one, one point around the world. So we're early days there, but that's the kind of constant theme. And candidly, I, did I think I would ever end up at Google. Like, no. Yeah, it's crazy. I kind of, it, it would, I, you know, it's one of those kind of dreams you have. And I fell into it by happenstance and sort of almost accident, but it's been, it's been a great ride. And obviously happy to talk more about that if it's interesting. But there, there's my incredibly long winded <laughs> <opening. laughs> No, <laughs> no, it's, it's awesome. Like, there's so much to unpack there, but like first, let's rewind back to that 2007, 2008 when you're applying to business school and there's this huge financial crisis, worldwide economic crisis. Why at that time, as an American living in New York, did you apply to London business school? I mean, did you, were you looking at yeah. U.S. business schools too? I mean, for was sure, it, were for you sure. missing the Singapore days? You wanted to get, get out of the U.S.? <laughs> well, it's funny you mentioned that. I, I, I mean, in a, in a way, yes. And so, I mean, first of all, none of my decision to apply that year had anything to do with what I thought was going to happen in the global economy. I had, I had no idea. I mean, I'm, I mean maybe you know, if you've seen the big short, like some people did. Yeah. But I, I, was not, I was not one of those guys. So for me, it was like I had reached a point in my career up until that point where I was probably had grown where I could in the company that I was at and wanted to advance my career. And I had done, a, I'd been a liberal arts major in college, majored in history, would do that all over again, loved it. Yeah. Um, felt like I missed some of the, call it the core quantitative skills that maybe some people who had majored in economics or finance had. And I wanted, I actually wanted to fill that in in my, my, my skill set. So that was a big reason for me to go to business school. And it was also essentially call it career transition or career advancement. I did want to change it, sort of change industries, even though it was related. Right. Um, but I mean, I did the same thing like a lot of your listeners probably are doing or have done, which is to you know apply to a couple couple schools or a bunch of schools, and you know you you hope and you see what works out. And I mean, I had, I had an opportunity to stay in the U.S., hmm. um, but I wanted London was always the the uh like the the wild card so to speak and and, Interesting. and I, I, it's funny that you mentioned singapore because for me it, it felt always like the the singapore choice and it felt like the 
hey, like, why not? Like, go do something totally different. Go do something that's a little bit that not everybody would choose. Absolutely. Um, but that is also incredibly valuable for, for different reasons. I had um, a friend and a mentor who I worked with at the time, Australian guy living in New York, who was doing the executive MBA program for London Business School. And there was there, I think there still is, mm-hmm. like a joint executive MBA, LBS in Columbia. And he would just would, and I remember he would just rave about LBS and he was going to London a bunch and I kind of came on. And then I had a friend from, from college who was there too. I put it more on my radar and both of them said like, look, this is the beginning. Like LBS is going to be getting, it's the beginning of like it getting even bigger. It's already yeah. an incredibly well-known brand essentially everywhere except the U.S., but it's growing in recognition right. even within the U.S. I think that's absolutely true and has kind of happened in the intervening 10 years or so. So, I mean, interestingly, there were some people when I told them where I was going that were like, where? where? Like they they yeah. already thought like London, London School of Economics, which is fine. I don't, I don't hear that as much as I used to. I think LBS's profiles continue to grow, which has been, which has been great. But yeah, it was, it was definitely not the choice everybody would have made. For me, I wanted something different and I wanted the two years for me to be not only, um, I mean, I wanted it to be an experience beyond just mm. school or something yeah. else. And I think I also just had this hunch that the people I would meet there would be different and more interesting, certainly more global. And LBS certainly talks about itself as like the global MBA. And I would totally, it, it is like a thousand percent true. And frankly, like I think when I was there, and I think this is still the case, I just looked at the stats today. There is still, I think probably the single biggest nationality at LBS represented is Americans, which is interesting because I mean, tend, Surprising. tend to be a yeah. lot more Americans who think of, of MBAs. It's still relatively unknown in places like the UK or Europe. But I mean, I, I laugh when people would talk in the US business schools and I guess I'm going to slam them for a second just politely. But like <laughs> people talk about like, what's, what's your international program? And it's right. like, oh, there's like, there's like a couple people from like, <laughs> there's like three people in my, my like section from yeah. someplace. And like we, and we have a bender. We go to like Tokyo and have a two week bender. Like that's like, oh, cool. Like that's a great, great international <laughs> experience. And like, look, not saying anything away. Like there are amazing schools in the US. Like I'm, for yeah. me, it was like two years in London. The whole thing was one giant cultural exchange and all my friends there and, and, and still are people from all over Europe, from Latin America, from Asia, the Middle East. Uh, That's awesome. Or just the global MBA. So, yeah. So you knew what you wanted to do. You knew you wanted to somehow be a part of the energy industry, save energy, you know, work on these big global problems. But like, was it a scramble to find an internship at an LBS because of that time period? Like you said, like jobs were kind of in flux at the time and recruiters were kind of in flux at the time. Like, how does that work? Yes. Like the internship yes. process leading to a job, obviously. It was a scramble, certainly. Um, and the LBS career services is fantastic. And I think they did as good a job as anybody could have done for those, you know, that those couple of years. That's why I'm almost like, I, I'm curious what it's like today. I bet it's mm. a lot more, I bet these years it's, it's, it's not as, as kind of dire, but like everybody was scrambling those couple of years. And it, I mean, instead of like telling the, the war stories, which I might enjoy, it's more like, I think what I would say, generally speaking, that maybe listeners today can, can take away from it is that it, it is always kind of, I, I would imagine it is always kind of a scramble. I mean, and there's kind of two choices. There's like the schools that you're either at or will go to will have awesome career services. It's something that each school prides itself on and competes right. on. And they, they certainly like, they have a bunch of metrics that they want to place students either in internships or full time or both. You know, there's that like big, one of those big metrics is like how many people are employed within three months of like of graduation. And by the way, like in you know, 2009, 2010, that was not a high number globally, but now it's like above 90% or something. But I tend to find in, in London or at LBS, the like on campus recruiting was incredible. All the major, every major company, bank, consulting, even, even Google back then was recruiting directly on campus. I remember that. But for like the London office or for if you were like from Europe, from the continent, there might be like the like Paris office or something. Yeah. It was those types of internships. In fact, like I also found that like London was the feeder for like Hong Kong, for Singapore, huh. for Dubai. A ton of people that I knew went to those either places for internships. Or but anyway, the, the, the two buckets are one was the on-campus recruiting, which took a bunch of people. But I think especially the years I was going through it, there were, because of the, because a lot of those internships just evaporated, I think a lot of the consulting firms didn't even do any internships that year. As I said, people were putting together their own things. And it was a lot of networking with alumni, of course, and people really, you know, everybody 
Everywhere is great. The alumni community at LBS is fantastic, as I'm sure it is at, at many schools. But I think both, so a long way of saying both because of that year, but also because what I was trying to do was different. It was just, a, it was a different process. And I was, I was, I actually went through, I think the banking, like on campus recruiting for like huh. in January for the, for the internship. Cause I thought, I, I thought it was like a foundation. I could do like equity research in energy for that summer. And then I would continue to branch out. Yeah. And then like got far, but then I remember they only had like one job at the end, like Oof. one internship for the whole bank. It was like, I think it was like B, like B of A Merrill had just joined and that went to somebody else. And so there it was, but I ended up, I mean, somebody told me at the time, and I've always said this to people subsequently, because I find that it's true. Like there's the stuff that's on the calendar. Like there's the, the rotational program internships. It's going to be early. It'll be like January, probably of your first year. And, um, it feels like everything's happening then. And certainly if those are the things you want to do, if you want to work for BCG for the summer, like go for it. If you want to work for Goldman, go for it. All the interesting stuff happens later. All the more interesting stuff for me, at least happens later. It's they're more companies that are hiring, are hiring for specific positions. They don't know in January what they're going to need in June right. and May. And so people right. had advised like, you know, be patient. Don't freak out because all your classmates are getting internships and you're not. And certainly like that was, you know, you're kind of going insane because you're, you are seeing yeah. this happen. But I, I luckily, and it, it came through campus recruiting. There was a, a small venture capital fund called Curzon Park Capital, about 30 million pounds. They did sustainable, um, clean tech investing really it was sustainable technologies, but they had a bunch of clean tech companies. They needed somebody for the summer and it came up like, I mean, it was wow. like three weeks before the end of the term. And, um, I got super lucky and it was, it was awesome. That would be a perfect fit because it was exactly, they were looking for somebody to do say. research on some portfolio companies and new investments. And so it was pretty much right what I had been doing previously. And it was a great experience. And it, it was, it, they even said going in, it was never going to be the like, it probably wasn't going to be the type of thing where you had a job at the end of the summer. I was very much mm. okay with that because I probably wanted to come back to the US anyway and um, wanted the experience. I mean, part of my idea was, there might be some something in venture capital someplace somewhere down the line for me working at a company in the space could mean maybe venture investing later on down the, the line. So this was right. a perfect way to just get my feet in. So it all happened in for me like off cycle at the very end through campus, like connection uh, through like something that was posted on the campus community job board. Um, and to the extent anybody else that's listening is going through this now or thinking about it, like I would say it again, be patient. The interesting stuff mm -hmm. happens late. Um, com like small companies don't know what they need until they need it. And if you stick around, I'm sure something interesting will happen. So nice. And then were you involved in any sort of, I mean, energy clubs, the energy conference, the LBS throws, and then Definitely. how did, you know, transitioning? I don't know if it was related to your, your job offer at Enernock, but, uh, how did you get that? How did you land that one? So two questions. I wasn't. In one. I'm no, just yeah, sneaking cool. in I questions. Was, <laughs> just hit me. Hit me. Keep it coming. Hit you hard. I was. <laughs> I was involved in the energy club. There was a great one at LBS. It was purely student driven, and there were you know second years and first years that were on there. The big signature event was the energy conference, which we had right. the second year, and you know the same thing. You're kind of involved the first year, and then you take. I think I had a leadership role my second year, although the, the details are, are escaping me. It was a great, a great experience. And like, I'm still in touch with some of the people that were on it. The, um, so that the thing was, I mean, and there were a ton of it, London being London, there was, there were some amazing sponsors for the energy club, but it, I say, but, but it, it was like Centrica, which is a big utility company. It was Shell. It was BP. It were, it was the traditional players. It was the oil and gas super majors, the big electric utilities. Which is great. I mean, they, they had, there were, there were feeders and like, I remember Exxon Mobil had a, like a management training program that recruited decently heavily through LBS. Same with BP, same with Shell. I have some friends who are there now and doing interesting things. But for, yeah. for me at the time, it just, it was the, not the direction I wanted to go in. I mean, I, I had, I had, I kind of flirted with it at one point where I was like, maybe there's essentially some work that could be done within these large companies that are focused on things like, biofuels or renewable technologies. It just wasn't there at that point. And I didn't want to, I didn't want to go in a rotational program where I'd be thinking about gas plant operations, for example, not taking yep. away from people that do that, but it wasn't for me. Um, so point being, even though the energy club was a great experience, it wasn't the feeder that I was perhaps looking for because gotcha. it was more of yep. the oil and gas focus. Um, 
Enternock for me happened uh, by essentially from by from my network. I, I a, f- a friend from college uh, who had been going through business school the year before me had 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 joined Enternock, and when I moved back to the states, I actually moved back to the states without a, without a job and was had put feelers out. But like, I'm sure some of your listeners and maybe some of your prior guests have said this too. I mean, there's there's no sub. It's hard to get a job when you're not in the city that you want to be. Right. In. Yeah. And just it's, especially if you have to, there's something about on the drop of a hat, being able to go get coffee or a beer and just, you, it, it, so it, you got to kind of be there to be able to pound the pavement. And so I kind of took a little bit of a leap, but I knew I wanted to be back in the States and move back to, to the New England area. And in, in earnest, then when I was back, was able to to activate um, contacts. And that's when, when Enternock happened. And so, I mean, it, in this way, like I, I, and I, I say this is not, this was no reflection on LBS's career services. They just, at that point, weren't really staffed to, to give these kinds of opportunities in the U S as I think that they probably are today. And again, it was like making it, I kind of had to make it myself. Um, that's, I mean, if I wanted to stay in London, I'm sure something I could have, I could have leaned in and something else would have happened. I'm I'm sure of it. And probably even sooner than, than when I, when I started the job that I did at Internoc, but it, it just wasn't, just wasn't, wasn't really that I needed to be back in the States and in the Boston area to really make that happen. Um, I will say too, this is like something I wanted to share just like, one of the th- two things that I find interesting from business school that maybe people that are going through it now are thinking about it. Well, like you, I, I kind of thought that you'd be this different person on the way out. Like you go into, maybe it's back to that misconception that like you just get, jo- everybody gets a job, right? Like you, right. you go to business, you just get a job, but like your resume is your resume and it'd follow you. And I remember those, the January interviews for the recruiting round for, for internships. I remember like, I took the exact same resume that I had applied with to that. I mean, except for like the very top Mm. line all of a sudden said like London business school, like that was it. Like nothing else had changed, but then you're just, so point being like what you've, you put a ton of work in your resume up until now, like own that and 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 celebrate that. And those experiences beyond, no one's just going to give you a job because you're in business school right now. They're going to give you a job because the business school shows that you have potential to do a lot more, but you're going to still be assessed on what your prior, experience who you are is the picture that, that, that you're made of. And so I just would, you know, it, it, think about that if you're going through these things. And then also your network stays with you. So I'd say your resume stays with you, your network stays with you. And sure, I'm sure you could, you could dive deeply into the network. And you, I'd say maybe half, maybe even more of the reason to go to business school is the network that you yeah. create. I firmly believe that. And that's not a slam on the academics. It's just a reality of that the network is incredibly important. And I'm incredibly fortunate for mine. But the network that you start that you came in with is also important. It's important to cultivate those and, and keep that going. Essentially, that's where my and job post MBA came from was my my network from before business school. And that's not an indication of the business school's network not being good enough. It's just that's how the world works. Yeah. And so I would advise just to the extent this is interesting or useful for listeners, call, keep keep your contacts cultivated from before. It's easier now than ever with LinkedIn, totally. but. You know, you're, um, these things come out and can sometimes come out of nowhere and you want to make sure you're connected as well as you can be with, with everybody from different stages of your career. I think that's such good advice. And we actually haven't heard that on the show, even though I've done like over a hundred of these, uh, to yeah, keep the, your other networks strong too during business school. Cause I, I'm sure it's easy to just jump. 110 percent in right and just be in that, sure. in that lake. But it's, it's sure. amazing that the way you're talking about how you're looking for renewable energy jobs, uh, you know, and maybe there were less of them back then because now it's such a hot industry. And like, you know, whether sure. these business schools are delivering on their promise or not, a lot of them are marketing, oh, like sustainable, you know, careers in sustainability and all this. But yeah. maybe LBS needed, you know, Vince Verity to, to get into all these companies and work for Nest and Google. So you can recruit hey, some LBS maybe. people now, right? And not just me. There's <laughs> many other people that came yeah. before me. I don't sure. think so. Yeah, sure. I think you're right there. And I mean, I, and I honestly, the more the merrier. The industry needs more people and needs more talent. And whether you're interested in the technology from it, I think that like we've been lumped in with like technology more broadly, which is fine. I come at it from a very, I would say, mission-driven approach and everything else kind of flows from that. And yeah. that's for some people too. I don't think that climate change needs to be nearly the political at least in the U.S., this like debate, it, the science is settled. It's not a debate. The, the people in this country, the only people in the world that don't believe, you know, don't know this for a certainty. And in fact, it misses the bigger picture, which is there's a tremendous business opportunity for a lot of people for in the, the transition that we need to make 
to a cleaner, more efficient grid and, and in both in fuels and in power and a ton of opportunity. I think that what we're doing is we're seeing, we're seeing that now. We're seeing it starting primarily with companies and with, with individuals. It, it's, it's not I, my perspective and I'm, I'm relatively late to this. It's not the, the state driven, you know, mm. in 2009, we were talking about the Copenhagen climate change talks. And the big question was, you know, is Obama going to go and is there going to be any pronouncement? And then, of course, there was Paris, which was an amazing step forward. And, and certainly the current administration is, has, I think, done terrible things to that and to the, but I think at the same time, the, the world continues to move on. And I think that in some ways it's settled that this is something that needs to be, that deserves to be fought for. And there's companies that are winning right now that are doing this. And I think that it's a tremendous opportunity for people like MBA students who are coming out who want to devote themselves to both a growth industry, but also one that really makes makes a ton of sense for the planet. I feel very, very, very strongly about that stuff. No, clearly. And, and so what would you recommend in terms of the recruiting? Like, are you involved in any of the recruiting stuff for, well, I guess for Enernock and then now for Google? Yeah, a, a bit. It's it's early days still for me at Google. I would say to really yeah. get firmly deep deep in that. I mean, we, we back at Enernock we had there was an MBA rotational program for a while. We we have one of those two now at, at Google, and then also specifically within wow. you know what we used to call the the Nest team. And so yeah. those are certainly out there. And, and I, I would say they should be part of the on campus recruiting that that comes mm-hmm. through the schools, both for the internship and also for the for the full time. It's a great way to start. It's certainly not the only way in, as as I'm in ev- I'm, I'm evidence of, but it's a great way to get to get in. I think that it's my group is the hardware group now, and it's we're at the beginning of I think a tremendous opportunity both in the, in the smart home, which is this new category, yeah. and there's a ton of opportunity that's happening. So I, I think that yeah, a, a company like Google has positions that are advertised both on the website and then also in campus. That's probably the best way to start. But I would also say like you know the, the general. I think what I found in school, in, in business school, and what I think is still consistent is, regardless of what you know, whatever two thousand eight, two thousand nine was, was being entrepreneurial for yourself. Amongst like, look at the look at the alumni lists, reach out. I mean, people might not get back to you immediately because I find that we're all kind of hyper connected and hyper busy. But like, I always found that the the easiest meeting I've ever gotten was when you're an MBA student, like looking to have a coffee. Like anybody will meet with you. Anybody should meet with Love you. Love that. Yeah, uh, and I think that you touch. You touch like a good nerve on a alumnus who remembers what it was like, but also probably feels some sort of guilt. Because I feel like all I mean, I'm projecting here, but like a lot of us wish that we could do more for current students and don't always know how. And so when somebody reaches out to you, you're like, yes, this is it. Like I can find, I can help. And so I think that I think people, not just me, I think people are, will respond to those types of things. People want to help. And like, I think everybody also knows, sometimes people think it's awkward. Everybody knows the subtext. Like if you're looking for a job, <laughs> that's fine. Like I think people want to, if they'll tell you straight up, I got something and here, here, take a look at this. Or if they don't, they'll brainstorm with you. I think either one of those could be useful. I, I also find too, you got to meet with everybody. You got to meet with a lot of people. It's almost, it's the conversations you have that kind of disqualify either companies or functional areas are as useful as the ones that you're like, that was awesome. So having a bad meeting yeah. is right. like good. Cause now you can like right. you probably have a huge funnel of opportunities and you're like, well, I can put that one to the side cause it doesn't seem like finance operations is for me. It's I, maybe I should focus more on marketing or something. I, I don't know. There's I, my, my point is like there's the formal recruiting process, which is super important. You got to keep an eye on, but I think the more interesting stuff is the, the personal the reaching out that you do. And I would say start like in your first semester, your first right. term in business school, start doing those. I, one of the pieces of advice that I got that I think was so true, there's always the like on-campus recruiting rounds and you, you probably sat through them or, or if you have it, you will. It's a cattle call and it's like, you know, 40 people from a company and you're all having drinks and it's like predictable. You like people spot the, the like, alums and they just get swarmed and it's that everybody's trying to like, no one's going to remember you at that, at that thing. Like you can actually yeah. only, you can only do harm to yourself. I firmly believe like if you're too eager, if you're like too mm. much, like people might remember that they might not remember the like really great conversation because you you tend to be like shouting over 10 other people who were there. My point of this is like, if you really want to work for a company, or if you really are interested in it, try to have coffee with the people that you think are going to be at that event two weeks or three weeks before the event. And then when you get to the oh, event, so you, already know, yeah. you can say, hey, like I've, you know, you, you've met that person already. That, that, that's the way to work. I think the alumni 
the intersection of like alumni networking plus on campus recruiting is to is to do your homework, reach out, know the people before you see them at the big cattle event, and um, you have a better shot. Oh, that's all. Awesome. Too much. That's my no, like, my, like, I'm, like, that I'm like accessing love, memories. Yeah, I love that advice. I mean, did you? Was it tough to like push those relationships along? You meet up with someone, maybe like we're doing now over FaceTime, and then maybe you try to meet them for coffee. How many times, how many chances do you get with these alums? I mean, obviously, probably some of them you get along better with than others, right? Sure. I think it's, it's, it's a good question. I think it's probably no, it's, it's probably a little bit different for everybody. I think that you probably get one, you probably get one shot. Not that it's, not, not that make it like overly dramatic, but it's mm. like the subtext is like, I'm asking you a favor. And sure, you can ask for multiple favors, but like, I, there is a little bit of an imbalance of like the value that's being <laughs> transmitted. Absolutely. Like you're kind of, you're like, you're not as like an MBA student. You're not, I mean, I, I would actually try to find, I remember, I remember like preparing for these discussions. I would like read whatever was going on in like the financial times or Wall Street Journal that, that like week and like come armed with like trying to add the a bare minimum of value to that person's job, even by being like, Hey, have you thought about this? Or like, maybe there's right. a connection here. And like, it probably mostly fell flat. I don't remember anything that like really like it was, I didn't get a job that way, but it was, you're trying to, you're trying to reach out beyond more than just like, Hey, but again, the subtext in the coffee is I'm here asking you for a job. And so if you can make it about more than that, or like maybe you were part of the same club uh, right. at school, whether it's social or career. And you can essentially, I think people like alums want to know what's going on at the school. So like give them an update about like the conference planning or like an interesting class you take. I think mean, people like that. I think you're mm-hmm. looking to make primarily a personal connection more than yeah. like wowing them with anything like functional that you can do. And then like a, a baseball metaphor that I hope registers and I'm not even a big baseball fan, but you don't want to try to hit a home run the first time because you're probably going to miss it. But like, it's okay to, to hit a single or it, it's okay to move the ball like a, a little bit up the field and to call yeah. that a victory. Like, it's okay. Like meet that person, have a good connection. As you said, Darren, maybe you could do a follow up if, if there was something to follow up on that's tangible. Maybe you see them at some alumni event. Like it's it, it's a process. And again, it, like anything, it's like cramming for a test. You can't cram for this. You have to move slowly because if you, you try to do it all at once, right. it looks it looks desperate. As opposed to like you've you're methodical and thoughtful. Um, so that's such good advice. And so if we can kind of dive into the weeds for say these MBA rotational programs. I mean, you've seen two types of them, right? And and two previous companies. I'm certainly other, you know, every company has their own uh, program and recruiting process, but how does that work? So like, what can someone expect? I mean, you're working for the hottest company or one of the hottest companies. I won't give you too big of a head. Um, So, right? Like I'm sure so many people would love to be a part of the home energy movement and market. So like, Yeah, if you can kind of dive into the weeds a little bit, like, is it two rounds, three rounds? Are you talking to five, six people, one, one person? How does that work? I have, I guess I can give more of a a sense of like what the internships are that I've seen. I unfortunately haven't been as involved in the actual like interview process yet. So I'm not sure how I, I can't give any, any, any thoughts on that. What I can say is that I think that. I, I see these these summer internships at bigger companies like a Google or even others as going kind of one of two ways. One is like it is truly like a rotation, and you are you're kind of getting moved, and and, and those tend to be very formal. And I think those tend to be more on the technical side. If you're coming in as like a programmer or an engineer, there might be actual there are specific things that you're you're trying out and kind of moving on every couple of weeks. What I've the, the majority of the ones that I've seen, both at Google and also elsewhere, are Essentially projects. So you are, it's, it's essentially a consulting project within a team where you are, you're given us, and, and half the challenge might be scoping it. I mean, it might, you know, we used to do these a lot for like help, help us at Enernock. It was like help us with like a market potential assessment for yep. taking the business to Chile or, and it was like, a, and, and the instinct of an MBA is to try to do more. You're like, I want to t- give me more. I want to take it on. I want to, I want to, deliver on all this. So I want like the executive interactions and I want to, and I would advise to like really carve out something small because you want to, hmm. you're not going to be able to have it to the extent possible. Sometimes you, you don't control this because you're given a project, sure. but try to carve out something small because you have a better chance of success of actually doing something tangible. That's, that is a benefit in this small time that you have eight weeks or 10 weeks is not, is not a lot of time at all. So 
the successful interns and the successful products I've seen have been relatively well scoped. They've been reasonable in what they expect. And also the people the people that do them, and it, it, there tends to be that there's like, you know, there are a couple of weeks of you're ramping up, you're meeting people. Then you kind of have a couple of weeks of you're, you're doing the work and mm. hopefully you're well threaded. And you, again, similar to the MBA experience, I think when you're, when you're an MBA intern, you can talk to anybody, including the like CEO. I mean, think they'll, they'll, they'll absolutely talk to you because you're seen as you kind of have this like top secret clearance where you can like yeah. go like better than Jared Kushner that you can like go <laughs> like throughout, you can go anywhere. He can't. I had to. I'm sorry. But you he, just um, you just sold the NBA to my entire audience. You get sorry, Jared, Jared, yeah. <laughs> Jared Kushner access, <laughs> right? But the um, but I mean, I think you have you have you have access everywhere within the company, and that's that's great. And then the last couple of weeks are probably you're putting together a presentation, and there sh- there probably is like a, a final presentation that is probably well received, but also maybe you're challenged a bit. And I think ideally you want to leave with something tangible that's like here's a here's a lead behind, here's the next step, here's what you can be doing, like some recommendations and. That's how I've seen. That's how my internship was, and I think a lot of the ones that are successful tend to be. Mm. Um, anybody that's done this before on the organizing and should be able to walk people through that kind of flow. Of course, like some internships go well, some some don't. I, I think that it's um, it's it's about like knowing that arc of that summer experience and being realistic about what you can do. Um, yeah. And and it, ultimately, it it is a tryout. I mean, it's it's a it's a great way, and, and it goes two directions. It's a great way for you to see the company and for the company to see you. You might like what you see, you might not. Either way, it's experience for you. And I would also say, like, I don't see a lot of companies, and I actually I have no idea if this is the case at Google because I haven't been close enough to it yet. If it's, there's not an immediate offer at the end of the internship, that doesn't necessarily mean a, mean you didn't do well. It's um, again, a lot of these companies they don't know what they need until the following year. So you right. see it as you've you have an inside track to the next thing, even if it's not an offer at the end of the summer. So and then so with with Enternock, you. Like, how many interviews did you have to go through there? Oh man, I had like sixteen. What? It was okay. It was, yeah, it was crazy. Oh that was back. It was back in the day. It was the company at that point, and this was two thousand ten. So it was. Yeah, it was transitioning from from like a startup where, and it was a mid sized company at that point. It had already gone public, but it was transitioning. It still had this feel of like everybody needs to know everything. Like everybody yeah. should be involved, and so even a, even like a hiring decision. They hadn't like figured out how yet how to how to be like okay not everyone needs to meet this person so I think I met sixteen people and it took it took a long time it took weeks I mean I was like again you okay. know I was I was I had already left school yeah so it was like you're you're just working but it's um I would imagine that that's not that rare at, at younger companies or at startups where you you probably it is more of a where like one person could really shift the balance of of culture patient as patient as you can be. Yeah, but it was it was it was kind of funny. That's crazy. And so, th- were they giving you like case case interviews, or was it more I a feeling? I did have a out? case. Yeah, I had yeah. I had a case. I think that I debate whether cases are useful hey, for other yes. things, except except consulting. I've never given a case. I think if if somebody gave me a case today, I would walk out of the interview. I would actually be like, I'm not doing this. You can't do that. When you're like a, you're coming out of business school, but I, I seriously question. I remember somebody. I, I had a, I had an interview once that was. It was for a company that was that I was excited about. Um, I don't need to say the name, but I, I, it was. I was excited about the company, but and was like very excited to talk about my ex- relevant experience in the space. And I felt like I had like I had worked in the energy sort of in the energy yeah. space. Like I was excited to talk about like, energy. And I walked in, and all the guy I wanted to talk about, he he, he gave me a like a, a pen for the whiteboard and asked me to estimate how many weddings there were in that city for that year. And like I did it, I don't think I did that well. And I'd done the case practice, and it, it, right. it's, it's it's I did I really question whether it's relevant. I mean, like if, if you're putting together a consulting team, like sure, like that's that's the thing, and you, you expect it, you know it. I I mean, I question whether it's it's, it's that. I, I I honestly think it's like lazy. I think it's lazy interviewing personally. Mm. But you know, this is now now I'm on my soapbox. But um, I think you can tease out the, the experience that people have and their, their capabilities in other ways. That said, if you want to go into consulting, yeah, you definitely got to prepare. You know, you got to prepare your cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, is that my, is that my, my controversial statement for the, uh, I love it. For, for the pod? We need more I think of these. That people are, I think, there you go. Vince already thinks that There's, people are lazy interviewers if they give a case. <laughs> Boom. I said it. Yeah. I want, I, I, like, we should have a new segment. It's like, get on your soapbox. And, there you uh, go. And then we played the jingle, 
and then you just go. Like, yep. what's the I point of talking about Jared clearance? Kushner's security clearance and, and, <laughs> and case interviews that suck? <laughs> but how? I mean, yeah, it, it's uh, well, okay. Let's move ahead a little bit. So one thing you left out is that you really, I mean, you really were promoted very quickly at Enernock. You went from marketing manager to manager to senior manager to director of utility sales to director of utility solutions. And, you know, now you're head of Northeast and Midwest Energy Partnerships. I mean, that's that's pretty quick progression in the limited time you've been out of B-School. Like, so what I'm trying to get at is, like, how do you succeed in this industry? Obviously, progression is only one measure of that. But sure. I'd love to hear your thoughts here on who have you seen rise and, and why and yeah. Great question. Thank you for that. <laughs> I mean, I, I think I've been, it's a combination of like good timing and, and being okay at some things, I guess. But yeah, it's been, I think it's also the, the, um, the progression at younger companies is, is just different because there's somebody told me once, you know, at, at Enernock, everything changed every nine months, which was, which was totally true. That was like the life, the, the life cycle of like a period of the business. And so. I think my team changed every nine to 18 months in some way. And I was very, I was thrilled that I was, you know, upwardly moving for, for most of that period. And I think the, the bit, and I would say it wasn't just energy, it wasn't just clean tech. There's a lot of industries that are like this. There's a, if you're moving fast and you're with a really capable, talented team, which is what Enernock was back in the day, they, you know, you, there's new, new opportunities open up. There's a bunch of white space on the map that are there who've done well. Are um, you put your hand up or you get tapped and there's new opportunities and stuff that you don't know. You got to keep your eyes open because you don't know what, what's going to be. I went from, yeah, m- marketing, which frankly, I didn't expect to ever be doing. Mm. But again, I mentioned that's where they were putting MBAs because it was more like marketing within the sales org, then moved to the, the more utility facing side of the business and then moved into a market development role, which is kind of a hybrid of regulatory affairs and and some sales and, and, and then moved into to sales or selling to, to utilities, both the, the software and solutions that we had. And then I'm doing a variation of that now at Google, which is both sales and market development as well. I didn't think I would ever end up there. It's, candidly, it's just you're kind of along for the ride. And that's where the, the interesting opportunities were and where I would demonstrated some, I guess, you know, some good, some good wins that we can do. And I mean, you, you mentioned this too. I mean, this is a little bit of a tangent, but I, I, I wanted to mention this at some point. Maybe this is a good place to, I mean, I really think that people should be, to the extent possible, mission driven in what they do. And your mission might be different. It doesn't have to be mine. I mean, mine is certainly more around beating climate change and whether your mission is healthcare or efficiency or technology or, or even like your family or, or like, it can be a lot of things. Like it doesn't have to be the things that are, that are mine, certainly, but be mission driven. And I think that, I think that's a really, hmm. You'd be surprised how many people are just think that what, you know, whether you're interviewing or you're working, like they want, people think that you want it, they just want to hear like a robotic, this is why I'm good at X, Y, and Z. And I think they want to hear who you are. And I think talking about your mission, what you're passionate about is super, super, super important. I think it, it really, I think it's important not only in how you present yourself, but also in how you, you kind of craft the arc of your career. I do think in saying that, something that I learned at Enernock was you got to be mission driven, but you also have to be functionally excellent. And yes. what, what I mean by that is, like specifically in the client in the in like the renewable energy sector, and I say this with great respect and admiration. There's a ton of people who who believe firmly in and who are environmentalists and who are who are who live sustainable lives and do everything that they should do, and they love to talk about that, and that's awesome. But like they might not be good salespeople, or they might not be good marketers, and you need to be both. And so, just having the story, just having the 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 mission is great, but you also need to be really good at the job that the company asks you to do or that you've yeah. been hired to do. And so that's, those aren't always the same thing. And so for example, like I had to get good at mar- at pure marketing, regardless of like, you know, I, you know, the climate change stuff, like how do you do marketing? I had to kind of yeah. learn that on, on the job. Same with sales. You have to figure it, you know, you have to, you have to be good at what you're asked to do. And, and I realize that sound kind of maybe, maybe sounds obvious, but sometimes it's, it's missing in that mission piece mm-hmm. where you think that mm-hmm. just the mission is going to sustain you. You also, and maybe that's how I was able to be like, relatively successful. I say humbly, like in the, in the, in the progression I've had is, is focusing on the goals I had each year, how the, what the team needed at that time and, and, and growing in that way. And so it's, it's that combination. So that's the Venn diagram, right? Of <laughs> that's where, <laughs> that's where you need to be. I mean, 
it was an amazing job. Like when I was living in Colombia, you would be traveling out there all the time to Medellin, Bogota, doing business development, right? And unfortunately, our paths never crossed. That would have been epic. <laughs> but the, um, the, the salsa, the salsa clubs would still be talking about it. They, they, they don't, <laughs> or we'd like to think that. We'd like to think that. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> So what did you find or would you recommend any resources to applicants and MBA students right now that you find particularly insightful into renewable energy or energy industry in general? I mean, I guess both in terms of an information source, but also in terms of, you know, if they're looking for jobs, is there, is there some sort of site or book or something that you found helpful? Yeah, uh, definitely. There's a couple of sites and uh, media companies that I think are doing a really great job in this space now that both, I'd say if you're looking at the broader energy efficiency, climate change space, they're just good to have on your radar for like the, the, the headlines, so to speak, for, for the industry. One of them is called Green Tech Media. Mm. I think it's GTM Research or GTM.com. They may have changed it. They do an awesome job. They have sections based on smart grid, on solar, on like, battery storage these days. Really, really great content, but also I think that they also have like, like, a, like a job search function within there too. Right. To me, that's, that's kind of like one of the gold standards. I mean, there's, it might sound strange, but like if you're looking at a, if you're in the industry, I mean, there's a ton of research reports that you can kind of just, just Google from whether they're kind of, they might not be the most relevant. Like currently, I remember just you, know, you can find stuff from from investment banks that are that are research reports or white papers that companies have put out. For example, Nest put out a bunch of white papers on the industry. If you're interested in a the company, there's probably a a press area that has content that the company has generated that is probably part of the story that they tell. That certainly has a perspective of the company, but probably is also one that's that's, that's well documented and grounded in some kind of reality. So I, I think those are mm-hmm. those are some some stories. And beyond that, I mean. I guess I mean I still read The Economist. I think that's kind of my single source of the of like yep. what's going on around the world. I wish I had more time to to, to read these days. It's kind of one of my my big things. But I, I think for for the yeah for the for the clean tech space, green tech media is really fantastic. Awesome. And I would, I would highly recommend checking them out. Did I miss out on any question? Is there any something that uh, I, I I missed that you want to say? Because I I feel like we we've, we've covered a lot of your journey. And you shared a lot of great tips. I mean, okay, I, open I have, mic. I have yes, open, open mic. mic. Hit me, yeah. See, this way you <laughs> I, have, do, I have some thoughts. No, keep, keep this, going. This keep way going you do the, I'll, I'll finish way off. Do, this way you do the work for me, Vince. Don't you? you <laughs> so <laughs> no, but uh, well, one question, one other question I had was like, you must see a lot of young graduates and MBA graduates excited to enter where you are, probably contacting you for informational interviews. But if you're looking to transition into the, the energy industry, like, like you said, the mission and the skills are critical. But is there some misconception or like something that you feel more people trying to jump into that space should, should consider? I mean, whether good or bad? Because I do think it does attract a lot of idealistic people. I mean, yeah. For better or for worse. And that's exactly, I think you're right. And that's also where I was going with the idea of being mission driven, but also functionally excellent. I think there's probably, a, there might be a lot of people that are just are into the idealism of it, but might not actually want to roll up their sleeves and get the work done. And that's, I have like thought about that exact thing where like at the end of the day, mm. in this, to be the companies that are being successful in the space are not just sitting around congratulating ourselves for helping to reduce some emission, you know, carbon emissions. We're, we're getting out there and, pounding the pavement and, and doing the work. And it tends to be, you know, part sales, part evangelization, part every year. So it's, it is all that. And that, to me, that's what's exciting about it is it's, it's not like, but I, I, I do, I, I agree. I temper the idealism of some where you got to, you got to be ready to work. Yeah. And that, that's certainly there. I mean, I would say also that I think there's an, so miscon, this is maybe a misconception, but there is a massive generational change that's happening in the energy sector now that, cannot be overstated. I mean, I go to a lot of conferences. I'm in my late 30s, I guess I can say. Um, <laughs> yeah. I'm consistently one of the youngest people there. And they huh. still talk about like millennials with this like 
like something between a fascination and like a fear and also like derision. Like they kind of also, yeah, they like think millennials are like on their Snapchat all the time. And like, how could they ever inherit the earth? And, you know, they just, they frankly people just don't get it. And it, there's a weird, I've seen various statistics on this and I'll probably get this wrong, but the, like the, the general theme here is that like a lot of people are going to retire in the next 10 ish years. And sure. There's like a, there's like middle ranks of management in large companies in the energy space that are there. People are going to fill that gap in some way, but like, I think a lot of them leaders question the pipeline for, for talent. And so whether you want to work for a large company or whether you want to work for a disruptor, it's a good time to be in this space because the whole thing is going to change and the people in the seats are going to change too. And we've got a front row seat to the future for people that again, want to put in the work. So I think it's a tremendous opportunity for folks for people who want to really make a difference, but also be part of, it's not like there's a ton of people in this space. I think it's a relatively mm-hmm. small community compared to, I, I think compared to others and one that's going through like a lot of transformation. Yeah. Yeah. And we've seen that through your whole career arc. I mean, I was just thinking about it while you were talking, like you went from hedge funds to equity research, to VC, to marketer, to sales, you know, now you're working for Google. Uh, you probably didn't think Google was going to be in the energy sector. I mean, it's just like you said, it's, it's, uh, I mean, wide open. So yeah. I, I, if, do you have anything, any, any last tips for our listeners? Any, uh, you want to make fun of me while you have the uh, soapbox? <laughs> I would never do that, Darren. I would never do that. I have too much respect for you. I have three, I have three things because, because, yes. you know, you're taught to have three things. We can all remember three things that I, I appreciate the question because I do have a couple of things that I did want to mention yes. that are, are perhaps yes. more interesting, that are just things that I thought about. The, the great one of them is on what I think the NBA gave me more than anything, and that is flexibility. Mm. Um, put differently, it gave me options. One of the things I'm most grateful for, and I didn't even talk about the, the incredible people that I met and the network that I have that's global that LBS gave me, which is which is amazing. Would love to talk about that on a future pod. You've invited other friends of ours onto two pods, Darren. And in fact, four years ago, I think somebody mentioned he was on a pod. So I just wanted to just mention that that Vince, this is be, my first. Be careful what but you anyway, wish. But be careful what you wish. Maybe for. just just okay. <laughs> I didn't go to the Avengers Infinity War premiere, but you know, I, I, but I can I can talk about other stuff. Um, but <laughs> I think that what the NBA gave me overall was was flexibility was was essentially confidence around flexibility. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. And what I mean by that is like, and I think especially coming out of that period of like 2008, 2009, 2010, where things were. Nobody knew it was going to happen, right? And I think subsequently we all got a little, perhaps got a little bit scrappier coming out of school. Stuff doesn't, stuff doesn't scare me in the same. Like there's, there's going to be opportunities, and I, I think that the NBA, and especially a global one like I had at LBS, but not just mine. There's a, there's a ton of incredible NBA programs out there, and I, I also think that this is an, an aside, but I don't think you can really distinguish between. This is probably another controversial thing to say. Like I work with people that have gone to business school everywhere. They're all fantastic. I mean, certainly, like anything, you meet some people who are you'd rather work with than others. And I went to school with some of those people. I have worked with some of those people. But like the NBA as a as a co- there's like a there's a skill set and a, a I think people that have MBAs from top from from a lot of schools are really truly excellent in what they do. So like you're kind of if you're thinking about going into an MBA mm-hmm. program or getting one or having gotten one, I think that you're like that. There's like a baseline excellence that I think you're doing. So so keep up the I guess the good work and that sounds lame, but I, I, I think that like if you've done an MBA, you're, you're, you know, you're, I think there's a lot of, there's a ton of great programs out there is what I'm saying. But ultimately the flexibility that it gives of like, if this thing doesn't work out, I, I'm something else. I'm, I'm confident I can make something else work out. And because of my network, because of my skill set, because of like the, the, the mindset of, of how these things seem. That said, I'm in a weird point now where I kind of assumed that I would be moving jobs every like two to five years for a long time. I am th- in- incredibly grateful and honored to be within Google now. And this could be one of those companies that I stay with for forever. Like who knows? There's amazing opportunities that are happening currently in the smart home with things like energy efficiency and connected products. Like there, this could be like a, maybe I'm here forever. I, I have no idea. Like that's the thing, like the open-ended nature of this and, and mm-hmm. the opportunities that things open because of this are are truly great. So anyway, MBA for me equals flexibility. And that's been fantastic. Number two, one of the things that I want to mention was somebody, we, we had like an alumni panel in my second year. We, and there was like a, a number of executives and I, I, for the life of me, can't remember where this guy was from, 
that's not really that relevant to the story, but somebody asked him, one of these alums, he was probably like in his fifties and was an executive someplace. Like, what are the, like, wh- what are the classes you use most from business school? Like, yeah, what, what, what do you use? That's a great question. And he thought about it and said like, you know, and I've thought this since, cause I, he said this, I can't give whoever this was credit, but I've totally ex- found this to be the case for me too. You go out of school thinking that you're going to use the hardcore quantitative stuff. So you, you think it's going to be like accounting. You think it's going to be like financial statement analysis. You think it's going to be, of course, like strategy. Yeah. I'm going to use Porter's, Porter's five forces everywhere I go <laughs> or finance. You think it's going to be that. And perhaps like in the first couple of years, as you're developing your career, like you're using the hard skills that you learn, certainly. But like he, what he said was the deeper he got into his career, the more he came back to the organizational behavior courses and essentially mm. like the intersection of human psychology, how you motivate teams, how you build teams, how you motivate them and stuff that I, I always found the OB stuff fascinating in, in, in school. A lot of my colleagues and friends like would fall asleep in class. I always thought it was yeah. super interesting. And it was echoed with this executive who was saying like the deeper he gets in his career, he's essentially like an HR man. He's like an HR function. He's just hiring people and building teams and I found that really interesting where like if you're if you're in that now and you're like in your OB classes, maybe some of that stuff is it might not be useful in year like right. one to ten, but like from ten and beyond, if you've been successful and you you're now a leader at a company, you're gonna be thinking about how you motivate teams, how you how you get the most out of people. I anyway I found that was interesting. I, and I've certainly found like that to be the mm. case as I've as I've gone as well. Last thought, and this is like my parting thought, I guess, is I really, having been out like almost 10 years now yeah, and crazy. seeing a bit more of the world, like everybody is making it up as they go along. I really firmly believe this. Do you think that like, I mean, there's this thing, imposter syndrome, right? That like yeah. everybody, you're kind of worried that you're going to get a lot of the stuff from this, that you're like, maybe they don't know that I don't know what I'm talking about all the time. And maybe they'll figure that out and they'll realize I'm an imposter. Everybody is making things up. <laughs> All the time. Everybody's <laughs> just making it up. Like, people don't know. There's, I mean, it, it, any of you that read cases, like, there's, there's not a right answer. There might be more right answers than right. others, but like, everybody's making it up. So, if you're at all like worried that you're, that you don't get it or like somebody else, you're, you know, you're at all questioning yourself or you're in a your job or position that you don't, you know, you're not sure about or everybody else seems to get it and you don't, like, everybody is making it up as they go along. Can I yeah. say an S word, Darren, on this pod or is that going to be a problem? Like, <sighs> Let me let me think about this. Um, yes, you know it's fine. It's fine. No, it's fine. <laughs> Everybody is full of shit. Everybody is full of shit. People are making it up as they go along, and um, and I mean, they, they, anyway, that's I, I, now I've gone on too long. But, <laughs> but keep edit this part out. <laughs> no, we're keeping it. We're definitely keeping yeah. it. Vince, thank you so much. This has been like a great chat, and I really appreciate your generosity and sincerity, really, in, in what you're saying. In the end the tips you're giving so thank you so much and we'll definitely get you back on for a second pod so it's your fault you asked for it can't wait i'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna hold you that one i will do that awesome. thank you darren thanks for listening to the touch mba podcast don't be shy we have a mailing list go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up and we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.